Mar. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to my talk. Um, actually, this talk will include several different uh, tasks and topics, but I was trying to find a common theme, which is to find uh, redundant information to improve information aggregation performance. And we also did this on um, different uh, data modalities and multiple documents and multiple languages. Um, I'm at the beginning, I'm going to give you a very brief overview about what is information aggregation and uh, uh, the overview of the general idea. And then, uh, actually, the different frameworks we use to use information redundancy are very diverse. Each of them was developed by one student. So I had basically this was this was done by uh, four different students, and they are, have different styles. Like some of them were being very conservative, so they chose to use very conservative models. And the others are like liberals, they <laughs> use very crazy models. They trust the information redundancy to a maximum extent. Okay, so um, many of you maybe know what is information regression, and people have different definitions. In this talk, I uh, would like to focus on identifying information from unstructured data and uh, semi-structured data instead of structured data because we think the unstructured and semi-structured text they are more challenging to deal with. And uh, um, compared to some other simple IE tasks, we not only want to know the different uh, indications for relations and events, we also want to know what kind of participants involved in this kind of relations events. For example, what time and what place and who are playing in the roles in the events. And IE is a very useful task for many different domains. For example, uh, in military domain, they are, likely they are interested in knowing what kind of attack or arrest events. And in employment uh, hi history domain, they would like to know uh, who is working for what company. And in medical domain, people want to know uh, disease outbreaks and so on. And then even nowadays, people trying to use IE techniques for scientific paper mining. So they want to know what kind of new terms are appearing in different scientific papers. So traditional IE, uh, i give an example here. This is a one sentence. And from this sentence, people can find there's a uh, end position event. And uh, the it's triggered by the word quit. And uh, uh, it involves a person, Barry Diller, his uh, personal entity. And uh, he quit from this organization. And his position was a chief, and the time was Wednesday. And we also normalize Wednesday to a detailed date. So this is a very simple traditional single document IE. It normally consists of different components. For example, we would need to identify the names, and then the, some titles like chief, and then use co-reference resolution to link those m different dimensions talking about the same entity together. For example, we need to know Barry Dida is the same person as chief. And then we also need to identify the time and normalize into the date. And then we try to identify relations among different entities. For example, this organization is located in France. Then finally, we come to the most challenging part is event regression, trying to organize all the previous information into a table. So for example, we need to know this Barry Dealer, he is a person uh, involved in this uh, end position event. And this event was triggered by the quit. Okay. And then uh, recently, we have a different uh, task to try to extend the single document IE framework to class document. So I give two uh, examples here. One is this one is called temporal event checking. So this, uh, if you have your laptop, if you want to try this is demo, you can try. So we can identify some central entities from millions of documents, and then. Uh, if you click this system, this system can tell you from multiple documents to information aggregation so that you can know uh, from the temporal chain what kind of activity this person was involved. For example, this person, Anwar, he was involved in a justice appeal event, and this event happened in Malaysia. So you can also check the events in the lo location maps. And uh, the other cross document IE task it's called knowledge-based population, which is uh, the main task I would like to talk about today. And it, it includes two tasks. The first task is called anti-linking. For example, if I s I'm reading a news talking about my uh, favorite actor, Jim Parsons, and I want to build a Wikipedia page for him, then the first thing I need to figure out is whether any of other fans maybe already did a similar thing, right? So then I go to check the Wikipedia. I found there are two. Uh, Jane Parsons, P 
pages, one is doing A dot parsons, the, the other is doing B dot parsons. Then I eventually I need to figure out this person is a singer, this person is a writer. So they are not both not the person I want to, I'm interested. Then I can create a new Wikipedia page for Jim Parsons. So you can see here, we need to do both the entity disambiguation and entity clustering. And then after I build up the, this uh, Wikipedia page, that's of course that's not enough because no one will be interested in empty Wikipedia page. So next step I would like to do is to use the information suggestion across documents to fill in the knowledge base. So for example, Wikipedia has this uh, info box in the right corner. So we would like to populate that uh, knowledge base using the information coming from news. For example, this, he, uh, this news was talking about he was a graduate of University of Houston School of Theater and Dance. So we can extract the uh, information University of Houston for as a school attended and then populate this into the knowledge base. So this is called the second task, it's called start filling. Okay, uh, and here this table shows different slot types we can extract from for persons and organizations. You can see for a person, we can try to identify uh, his uh, uh, biographical facts and also employment history and his family information and so on. For organizations, we are interested in uh, what are their uh, top members, employees, and their subsidiaries, so can we can see the hierarchical tree of this organization and their headquarters and their website and so on. Um, and then we can notice that this information all come from the same language, but uh, in mo many cases, uh, for example, uh, if some many fans in America, they are interested in the famous director Ang Lee from Taiwan, but uh, most of his information is actually embedded in Chinese. So we are also interested in how we can extend the task to cross lingo. For example, uh, this person's parent name is uh, written in Chinese news, and his birthplace, uh, Taiwan Pingdom, this kind of information won't appear in English news. So we want to extract this information from foreign languages and translate them into English, so that uh, English native speaker, they can get an English knowledge base from foreign documents. Okay, so all this kind of task setting looks really nice, but uh, um, there's one bottleneck here, which is the performance, I mean the quality of the information. Actually, this kind of quality uh, problem exists in single document IE also, because if you look back at uh, for the early days of IE, since Mark, we don't have a good performance, even for event expression. Always, it's uh, we have we are seeing uh, something called performance ceiling because we cannot get a higher performance than 70 percent for event injection. And for the cross document sort of filling task, the best performance in knowledge based population check last year and this year was uh, a little bit lower than 30 percent. So it's very challenging to get a higher performance than 30 percent. So our goal here, research goal, is to identify topical read documents and then we can integrate the effects so that we can take advantage of information redundancy so that we can improve the information ingestion results with low cost. And also we would like to use the results to populate the knowledge base. So um, the basic intuition is that when the data grows beyond some certain size, for example, if we are dealing with the web scale data or uh, millions of news articles, then IE task is naturally embedded in rich, very rich context. For example, you may know which who are who will who will writing who are writing this document and uh, who is the blogger of this blog and uh, who are the Twitter of this tweet message. So we can take advantage of redundancy from large scale data, and then we can look at uh, some background knowledge for some uh, famous entities. We may look at the Wikipedia or some existing knowledge base so that we can take advantage of the background knowledge, and also we can. Uh, use diverse documents, systems, and languages, and even different data modalities. For example, nowadays more and more web pages are written in multimedia. So whether we can use the information extracted from one data modality to improve the other. Okay, so this is the general intuition. So now the detailed question is, how can we do it? Because this kind of data are so overwhelming. Um, and if we, you just put in everything into the pool, then it's very really disorganized. Okay, so now let's look at, at how human do similar things. 
So as we all know, uh, students, when they have some homework deadline, they like to get together, they find their friends, and they do group study. Uh, and then when we were reviewing some funding proposals, we like to organize people to do panel. So this kind of work is called a collaborative human learning. It's, also, it's always a way to take advantage of redundant information because people have different background, they have different knowledge. But there's some organized way to do it. It's not like uh, you keep talking. You find a certain time and a certain topic, and you do some active discussion. So our goal is to imitate this process. So instead of just considering IE as a single task, we would like to put it into a very rich context. For example, uh, for news, we want to know who were reporting this news and which news agency it's coming from and uh, which t time and location uh, these events are talking about. And for tweet, we want to know uh, who is the employer of this tweeter. And uh, if this is text message sent from a soldier, we want to know the detailed location of this soldier and the profile of this soldier. Uh, and also, for the IE output, we don't want to look at isolated facts. We propose some concept called information network. So basically, each it's a, um, multiple graphs, and each node is, can be an entity, and the links can be all kinds of relations and events. So the nice thing about this information network is that it can give flexibility that we can incorporate this kind of background knowledge. And also, it gives us some strong graph theoretical framework so that we can use global inference across the networks. OK. By the way, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to interrupt me. Um, OK, so now let me go to the detailed solutions to capture redundancy. I'm going to talk about three different ways. And the first solution is the most conservative one. Uh, this was done by m one of my students. I always call him as Mr. Conservative because this is a very conservative framework. This is done through integer linear programming. Let me explain the intuition first. Uh, suppose this is output from, this is actually real output from our very simple single document IE output. So it mistakenly identified George Bush who was located in Iraq. Or maybe he was, but this is a, apparently a mistake. And it also mistakenly identified George Bush as a member of Hamas with a very high confidence. And also identify Hamas is located in the United States. Uh, I don't know what, why this happened, but this is real output. So the one clue we can see here is if we can know the different uh, organizations uh, George Bush has a membership with, they are located in different countries, then may maybe we can filter them out. We can remove the link from George Bush to Iraq because he was already located in Washington. He was working. He was a member of the uh, Republican Party. So we can filter out these long links using this interdependency or using some inference. OK, so now let me show you a more reasonable output. This one mistakenly identifies Saddam Hussein as a member of uh, Hezbollah Party and Amnesty International. However, since these two organizations uh, from our other IE output, we identify the, their headquarters are located in UK instead of Iraq. However, he was living in the city in Iraq, so with high confidence. So we can see if we put that into an information network, we see lots of conflicting facts. Uh, so the idea is that if we enforce this information network to tell a coherent story, then we can filter out those long links so that we can get better results. So the main motivation is that when, according to the sci some psychology, psychology researchers, they said if the text includes uh, uh, very coherent story or fewer conceptual gaps, then this text is easier to understand. So the same intuition here is if our IE output is m each fact is more consistent with other facts in order to tell a coherent story, then it's more likely to be a correct fact. That's our hypothesis. OK, so now the idea is how we can learn this kind of interdependency. We don't want to do manual encoding, because if you move from one domain to the other domain, then you have to do the rule uh, encoding again. So we would like to learn this interdependency automatically. So what we did is we tried to uh, focus on two types of um, interdependency. One, we call this as pairwise. Basically, we look at any two types of relational events, whether they can uh, 
coexist in the same information network or not. So this is very simple pairwise. Simply we check the pointwise mutual information. It's basically looking at how likely two types of events can appear at the same time. And the second type, we call this as a triangle interdependency. So basically check any three types of relation events or uh, three types of entities, but with two relations, whether they can appear together. So let me give you some examples. Uh, OK, so for pairwise uh, interdependency, for example, if we know one person is a has some business relation with another person. For example, this person is a lawyer of the other person. That is not likely they, they are family members. Maybe that happens, but it's not, a very, it's not unlikely. It's not, it's not likely. It's very unlikely. Um, and then triangle depend interdependency, for example, if two people, we uh, mistakenly identify them as a, uh, so one person is identified as a member of two organizations, but then the other event exception result tells us these two organizations, they are attack attacking each other. Then it's not likely uh, all these three facts are true. So there must be some incorrect output. Right, so we learn this kind of interdependency for pairwise and a triangle. And then we can uh, improve the results by putting these uh, constraints into some, we call this as integer linear programming framework. The basic idea is that for any fact, we either keep it or throw it away. So if we keep it, we uh, generate the result as one. Otherwise, it's zero. So it's become becoming a binary integer linear programming framework. And then the constraints come from two sources. One is the pairwise constraint, the other is triangle constraint. So for the pairwise constraint, if the interdependency is so low that we have to only keep one of them. So uh, that's that means x, a, and two are relations, we only keep one, at most one. So it, the, the sum of them should be less than one. For the triangle, uh, f among the three uh, inter for the three relations, if they violate some constraints, for example, like the, the person work with the two organizations and two organizations, they are attacking each other, then we only keep at most two. So we use these two formulas to form the constraints. And we can, we can tune the, uh, the optimization framework using this parameter. So if this parameter is larger, that means we penalize more on those output with low confidence value. If it's zero, that means we treat all the output equally. We ignore the confidence value. OK. So we did exp this. Exp so th you can see this is a very conservative framework because basically we, uh, the solution is very simple. We keep it or completely throw it away. And we only look at those facts that have very clear interdependency. OK, so we test this idea on uh, large scale newswire documents. And because we don't have a good standard, so we, that's why we, we can only check a precision. We cannot check a record. So we define our scoring metric. This is similar to um, the search lens in IR community, if you are familiar with that. Basic idea is that before people find the I cloud effects, how many incorrect or redundant effects the user has to browse. So if this cost is larger, that means the system is bad. So we test this on, for example, the, this is a performance on membership relation. And uh, this black curve shows the baseline, means we uh, just take all the single document IE output. And then the, uh, the, different, the other curve shows the performance after we apply this framework. Uh, the blue one, when we uh, penalize more on the low confidence output, we, you can see we get significant reduction on the cost. And the same observation was found for family relations. And then we try to check the detailed results. We see that uh, this green curve shows how many of the errors we removed they were actually incorrect. And the black, uh, red one shows how many of them we actually removed incorrectly. They, are, they should be correct results. So you can see as we uh, increase the, this par parameter, we can uh, throw away more and more errors. But we also sacrifice by throwing away some a few uh, correct answers. But overall, we can see the framework did help because it uh, removed a lot of errors. So that looks nice, but uh, we can see among so many facts, the number of 
the upper bound of the errors we can remove is still limited. And we can see this framework won't increase your record because it can only look at the output of an existing system. It won't be able to find the missing information. So we thought this framework is too conservative. OK, so now let's come to the second framework. Um, the basic idea is to capture some background knowledge the, through the information network using topic modeling. <coughs> OK, so if we, we look at the event ingestion task in uh, the information network, then uh, traditional IE actually lo only look at this part. You look at the events and look at the arguments, and maybe some entities also relevant to these events. But if we look at, at the whole background context, this event may have some cause or pre-sequent event happened before it. And then you can also see some uh, subsequent event happen after it. And then, uh, through the whole document, actually there must be a lot of topical read documents. For example, if you're talking about Hello King news, then the reporter won't bother to introduce al all the background in within today's news because he assumes you already read yesterday's news, right? So there must be some stories from yesterday's news which are read topically related to today's news. Um, and also, different uh, news agents or different uh, reporters, they tend to report different uh, kinds of styles of events. So those knowledge mi must be very relevant as well. Uh, so how can we incorporate all this information into some nice and neat framework? We use a topic modeling idea. The idea is um, the traditional topic modeling only look at uh, the distribution of the words uh, within each document. But uh, here, we try to propagate the entity information from things like uh, authors and entities appeared in a document, and also the publication venues into the topic modeling. Uh, so let's look at uh, some example. For example, if we have this a bunch of news documents, and now we can organize them into different clusters. For example, this blue one, maybe they are all talking about, uh, uh, let's say, nuclear war, uh, maybe, because <coughs> it talk about, yes. Oh, yes. Actually, this is our new uh, IMM paper this year. Um, it's the, I think the title is called Using Topic Modeling to Enhance Event Ingestion. Event Ingestion. Okay. Yeah. I can, s I can send you uh, some more of the papers later if people are interested. Yes. Yeah. And uh, please rem do uh, stop me if I'm going into too many too much technical details. OK. Uh, so the idea here is we can organize the documents into different uh, topic clusters. The blue one is mainly talking about uh, uh, the maybe nuclear war because it's talking about the Korea and the some uh, government leaders from China and United States, they are meeting each other. The, for example, this one may be talking about attack uh, like Iraq war because you can see army, <coughs> troops, and the British and so on. And the third one may be talking about some economic news because you can see numbers and dollars and government, million, things like that, company. So the idea is, although we don't uh, cluster the documents into very fine-grained level, we can somehow group them into topical related. And then uh, the idea is, for example, if the word fire is a very ambiguous word, it can mean uh, end position, you fire someone from a company, or it can mean attack uh, event. But uh, if you just check this distribution of this word in one topic cluster, most of the time, it will only talk about one event type. For example, it's not likely like uh, fi half of them is talking about end position, half is uh, attack. They are likely to be more converged than the uniform distribution. And the same thing happens for event arguments. For example, Putin can play as different roles because he's so busy. He can involve in a meeting event, or he can involve in a movement. He's visiting some other countries. But if you look at uh, some certain topic cluster, his uh, argument role is t also tends to converge. So here I'm showing you some uh, general distribution of the event types. For example, this is one topic cluster. This one includes lots and lots of red events, which is conflict. So compared to it, this one, the second cluster includes very few red events. But the second one includes a lot of black justice events, and which appear very few in the first cluster. OK. 
Okay, so this one was these two are for English, and we also checked for Chinese. So the, these two uh, pictures shows the distribution for Chinese. We can see the similar observation. It's not so obvious as English, but we still can see, for example, the red one is conflict appears a lot in this topic cluster, and very few in the second. So the intuition here is if we can somehow organize the documents into different topic cluster, then do uh, event exertion, training, and test within that topic cluster, then it's likely to give us better performance. Uh, so the first experiment we did is to use active learning to speed up the annotation or training of the event exertion. Uh, so here we are gradually adding more and more training documents, and we check the performance of the tagger um, test set. Uh, so here, uh, the black one, the black curve, is passive learning. We're just graduating, uh, adding the documents according to alphabetical order. The red curve here shows that we always add the most topically related documents for each test document first, and then move to those topically unrelated documents. So we can see using about 25% of the training documents, we can already get a comparable performance as we using the whole training data set. So now we can tell our sponsor, before you need to pay us $1 to do annotation, now only need uh, one quarter. So we saved a lot of annotation cost. And the same observation was found for argument labeling. So the, the, these two are for event trigger, basically to tell this event is uh, a tag event or not. The, these two curves shows uh, what kind of entities are involved in the event. So it's called event argument labeling. We also got higher improvement. And this was done for both Chinese and English? Oh, yes. Actually, I had some backup slides showing the different genres and uh, uh, languages, if I'm interested. Yes. So uh, the, the, uh, the previous one was for English Newswire, and this one was for English Web Blog. So you can see the, uh, the red one compared to the baseline, it's got high performance. And this one was for Chinese Newswire. You can see it's even got a better performance. Uh, so the red one was uh, the active learning, and the black one was the passive learning without topic modeling. Yeah, so uh, that only includes the training process, but we still want to uh, improve the test process. OK, so the second experiment we did is we tried to do inference. Remember when I was talking about the integer linear programming, I we did an inference using the interdependency among relations. So now we want to consider everything that belongs to one topic cluster, they have some kind of interdependency among different effects, so we can do inference. For example, uh, if I have a trigger word which is ambiguous within one topic cluster, then how about I simply propagate the majority label to everything? And if this argument also has different event roles, then I always trust the most um, uh, most probable one, and uh, I propagate into override other event arguments. For example, putting can only be a meeting uh, attendee in one topic cluster. So we adjust the global confidence using this way, and uh, we, can s we can see much higher performance than the baseline. Actually, this whole propagation idea is not new, because uh, some of, uh, we did some previous work using information retrieval to group the relevant documents. So we proved that the gain we can get from this framework is even better than you use information retrieval to collect the relevant documents. OK. So here I'm also reporting different languages and different genres. Uh, we can see uh, for all of them, we got a higher performance. Although the uh, results for English web blog was kind of depressing because the scores are really, really bad. <laughs> um, I, I also want to point out that for this task, uh, it's also very difficult for human annotators. So the final performance is actually close to a single human annotator. Okay. Okay, so now let's move on uh, to the third framework. Because so far we consider that topic modeling uh, everything topical related, they are they have include some redundant information, but we only focus on <laughs> one. Uh, I mean, each time we do experiment, we focus on one language and one system, but the redundancy can come from a uh, wider context. So let me introduce the test bed first, and then let me talk about how what kind of other redundant information I can use. Um, so 
Remember the first interlinking task I talked at the beginning, try to figure out which Wikipedia page that Jim Parsons should uh, link to. So the baseline system includes as follows. We send in a query, and then we try to uh, figure out what are the knowledge-based candidates this uh, entity should link to. And then we apply different ranking algorithms to figure out which Wikipedia is most likely uh, candidate that we should link to. And apparently, in order to ranking these candidates, we can apply all kinds of learning ranking algorithms. We can use unsupervised methods. For example, we just look at the TF-IDF of the document the contest. Or we can use a supervised classification. We can consider each pair of the candidates as uh, better or worse. Or we can even use graph-based ranking and so on. So the basic idea is if you can uh, imitate all kinds of r ranking algorithms, then you can get diverse systems. So my students implemented all these eight uh, different uh, algorithms w within one week because everything was written in the paper by from other people. So he implemented this, uh, all the eight different systems and presented results to me. And, and I, I, s I said, well, this is really nice because you repeat other people's work, but this is not going to be a thesis because there's really no novelty here, right? So the problem now is can we take advantage of this uh, results? So now we have uh, multiple systems. Can we take advantage of redundant information or redundant output from these systems and can do a better job? OK, and then uh, one week later, he came back to me and he said, OK, now I want to imitate the student group study or the human collaborative learning idea into this task. Um, OK, so let's look at the, the general standard framework. We will have a query, for example, Jim Parsons from NEOS. And we have, uh, let's say, seven different candidates from the Wikipedia uh, pages. And the basic task is to rank these candidates and in order to figure out which one this query should be linked to. Right? So it's basically a ranking problem. So the first idea he had in mind is, instead of looking at one query, just this Jim Parsons itself, what about I look at his collaborators? For example, if I can figure out uh, his spouse, uh, well, he doesn't have a spouse yet, but he has a boyfriend. So his boyfriend should be linked to which Wikipedia? Then that may give me some redundant information. Also, if I know uh, his graduate school, University of Houston, should be linked to some Wikipedia page, that may also help me to disambiguate who this person is. OK, so the idea is if I can find all the collaborat collaborative queries for the, this one, then I can get a better ranking quality. And he ca we call this as a micro-collaborative ranking framework because it's focusing on micro level, the query level. The second uh, rank collaborative ranking is because we already have eight systems. What about we apply, we do uh, some interaction, let these eight systems collaborate with each other so that the decision won't be made based on just one ranker. We, it will be based on eight rankers. So we call this as a macro-collaborative ranking. And then finally, we combine the micro and macro together into the uniform. We call this the micro and macro collaborative ranking framework. Yes, so, Mark? Uh, when you do the micro collaborative mm -hmm. ranking, where are you getting these relevant things to the particular entity? Yeah, very good question. Uh, yeah, so we use uh, two different uh, ways. One, uh, we call this as a uh, agglomerative clustering. So basically, it's a greedy search. You look for any um, other documents, include the same entity mention, and then look at their context. So we also pro uh, compare their profiles. For example, if we found this person has similar age or have a similar hometown, then it's likely to be a, a, a collaborate, collaborator. And then the second uh, way is called a graph-based uh, clustering. So we basically consider, uh, at the beginning, all the documents, they, they are candidate collaborators. So all of them are fully connected. Then we try to cut the graph so that we can get optimal uh, subgroup as the collaborators. But isn't it implicitly yeah. then you actually disambiguate who is this person? Oh, yes. So the collaborators m may also give us a lot of noise. That's a very, yeah. very uh, interesting question. That's also what we are doing uh, next to improve. So we do see some uh, noise, noisy uh, collaborators. They didn't actually help. But the, the, the exact idea is how we can uh, take advantage of the uh, redundant information from the useful collaborators. Because when students do a uh, group study, they may also find some friends that are not so helpful, right? So we need to find a way so that they can. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the three different interaction ways so that we can remove the noise. 
Yeah, so uh, actually here showing the three different ways we can deal with the introduction. The first one, we always trust the, it's called uh, average function. So we always trust the voting results. For example, if eight rankers give us different results or eight uh, collaborators give us different results, we do majority voting and we trust the average confidence. And the second one is we trust the maximum function, means that um, we always trust the, um, the collaborator that give us largest distance. I mean, this really doesn't make sense because you, it, intuitively you should trust the best still, not the worst one. So that's why this one didn't work. You can see the, uh, the starting point is the baseline results, and the, uh, the curve shows when you add more and more collaborators how, how the performance uh, change. And the third one is that we all trust the best collaborator. So we only uh, trust the single best collaborator. So we can see uh, the majority voting, I mean the average function, more um, democratic <laughs> method, give us best results because uh, it gives us, uh, so the, the black curve in each picture shows when we use graph clustering method. And the uh, red one shows a greedy aggregative clustering. So you can see graph-based algorithm actually give a, 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 high, a little bit higher improvement than uh, the aggregative grading algorithm. So this table shows the gains we get compared to each baseline ranker. Uh, compared to the lower ranker like TF-IDF, the gains uh, was much higher. But uh, uh, compared to the best ranker, for example, the ListNet was the best uh, baseline system, the performance, the gain was small. So now we start to ask ourselves why this gain was so small compared to the baseline ranker. And then we figure out the reason is because we, although we were using our own systems, eight different algorithms, but these different systems were trained from similar resources. So they come from the same training data, similar features, and so on. So we tried the same idea on other people's system output. Because in this, th this knowledge based population is the open evaluation, so every year we get a a lot of participants uh, to compete uh, the same task. So we pick up the top 10 systems and uh, we add them into the framework. So we use their results to as collaborators. And uh, we found that um, when we add the top five, we can get a higher performance, which is much higher than the best system. But uh, as we get add more and more uh, systems, actually the performance goes down. That means if we have uh, collaborator, but the collaborator doesn't have a reasonable performance, comparable performance with uh, ourselves, then we won't get uh, good enough games. And then if we combine the two levels of collaboration, query level and the uh, rank level, uh, this is called the micro-macro collaborative ranking, then uh, the black curve shows the, the final performance. We can see compared to the top three different rankers, what uh, any threshold we choose, we get higher performance. Okay, um, so now we want to apply the same framework to the second task, which is to find the profiles, the slot filling task. We want to find the persons, um, 26 types of slots, and uh, 16 types of slots for organizations. Um, ideal setting is that we want the collaborators come from different systems, and we should uh, be able to access their intermediate uh, results and uh, they should use div diverse algorithms and using diverse data sets or even diverse linguistic resources. But that uh, setting is too ideal. We normally can get, cannot get that setting. So we only test this on two other more practical settings. One we call this as a low transparency. This one means that um, although we, don't, we cannot access the intermediate results, but we, we are sure that uh, they come from different uh, algorithms and using different resources. For example, the different uh, systems participate in the same evaluation. And then the second setting is that, uh, for example, we have our eight rankers, but they were, we can access the intermediate results. We can e even know, for example, each sentence is passed to what kind of structure, but we don't have diverse enough uh, linguistic resources or data. So, what do you mean by linguistic resources? Uh, for example, we use lots of uh, dictionaries to encode as features. So in other people's systems, they may use different resources. But uh, for our systems, we cannot ensure that because we only have this bunch of resources we can use, right? Mm -hmm. 
OK, so I think I, I'm going to skip some of the details of the baseline systems for sort filling. Basically, we use three different uh, baselines. One is information ingestion. Uh, we use the similar idea we did for the uh, topic modeling, and we get together information from cross document. The second one is based on pattern matching. We learn patterns from label data, uh, and then uh, we assess those patterns. The third one is question answering, because we have a query. We want to know all the profiles for this query. So we send it into open source question answering. And our work was focusing on how we can expand the queries and uh, validate the answers. So now we have these three different uh, algorithms. And we, uh, apply we did uh, the ranking, uh, collaborative ranking idea to three two settings, low transparency setting, and uh, the second is high transparency setting. And uh, we can see that uh, compared to the previous two task uh, framework I talked about, uh, inter integer linear programming and uh, uh, the topic modeling, the advantage here is we can introduce external knowledge. For example, in high transparency features, because we know what kind of resources are were limited in the baseline system, now we can introduce more global features to validate these answers. And this kind of evidence won't be able to be used in the topic modeling or the integer linear programming framework. So compared to the baseline systems, we get, uh, this is w was for the high transparency setting, means our own systems. We get higher performance than the three baseline systems. And compared to the low transparency setting, we also get uh, uh, 4.3 higher F measure than the best performing system. And we also want to apply this to cross-lingual because uh, maybe some IE systems for foreign languages are not so mature, but they can at least give us some redundant information or additional evidence. So we would like to combine multiple systems from different languages. Uh, so remember I said we want to populate the English knowledge base using foreign documents. So we can do this in two different ways. Either we translate the query into the source language in the foreign language, and then do foreign language IE. right? The second way is that uh, we translate the whole s foreign language documents into English. Then we apply the same English IE system. Um, however, when we look at the baseline results, we found out a lot of different problems. First of all, machine translation. It's good Samara is not sitting here right now, because we complain about machine translation so much. Because it's always give us some strange results for the important information. For example, we are searching for the query Elizabeth. Uh, and, uh, this uh, trans the translate sentence becomes something like uh, Queen Elizabeth did not flavor in the Gulf region, blah, blah. So actually, this sentence was talking about she didn't like the uh, demonstration soldiers did to uh, celebrate the Gulf War. Right? So I mean, you can still see the general meaning from this translation. But uh, if we apply English IE on this sentence, then uh, English IE will mistakenly identify golf as a residence place for Queen Elizabeth. So there's really nothing wrong with the word by word translation, but uh, it mess up the structure. So it won't uh, give us any credit when we apply information generation. And the second type of translation error comes from just the name translation. For example, if we are searching for uh, the information for, for Celine Dion, and because the query includes a uh, uh, what do you call this a syllable lean then uh, the system mistakenly match the translation from Clinton because um, wh when we apply the source document they are basically the same character so then uh, we will find all kinds of information about Clinton to populate the knowledge base about Celine Dion which is very bad right okay and um, Sometimes the query was perfectly translated, but uh, then we find the perfect answer. But uh, since the answer was mistakenly translated, so we still will miss mess up the final answer. For example, uh, we know that uh, the query is David Kelly, and this was correct perfectly translated into Kelly in the empty output. But uh, we cannot find any answer from this sentence. The answer is supposed to be Oxford University. So can you guys guess what's, what's going on here? Can you pick out which phrase was supposed to be for the university? You probably can see the biology, microbiology, biology department or something, right? So 
Yes, yeah, so, so maybe for, for uh, Chinese students, you may guess uh, this was translated into the free basket for trapping because there's one character in Oxford in Chinese character means the free. So I mean, for, from machine translation output, you really cannot guess what was the detailed reason and how to fix it. Um, and then we thought about since in monolingual task, when we apply multiple rankers, it, we got a much we, we, got, we got nice games. So how about we ask multiple MP systems to help us? So we asked uh, about uh, five or six state-of-the-art machine translation systems. So they did uh, give us diverse enough results. For example, this one was uh, for um, Russian news agency uh, quoting the letter Bobby Lev, blah, blah. So they translated the name of Bobby Lev into d many different uh, translations, but none of them was correct. For example, you can see this one was uh, translated into German graph. I think maybe because uh, part of their name, uh, like the two characters were translated into graph. And then uh, this one's the worst. It was translated into 1988 left. Main, maybe because the first two characters was, was Bo Bei, which is similar to the uh, pronunciation of the 88 eight in Chinese. So uh, th that didn't help. We tried to uh, do collaborative ranking among different machine translation output, it didn't help. And then we look at the error, errors and we try to break down them into uh, pies, try to see how many percentage errors come from where. And then we can see from the first pipeline, which is basically we do the query translation, and then we uh, search the answers from foreign documents uh, or from the machine translation output. Then we can see uh, the major errors come from machine translation. In the second pipeline, the errors were more diverse because it involves the source language uh, word segmentations. And uh, because the foreign language IE is not so mature as English IE, so we can also see a lot of semantic type errors, slot type errors, and relation event exhaustion errors. OK, so the idea is, although these two types of pipelines, they are not perfect, but they are somehow complementary, because you can see uh, query translation errors won't appear in the second pipeline. And what is segmentation errors won't appear in the first pipeline. So our idea is still to use a collaborative ranking, but now we want to focus on more global validation. So we try to incorporate different features coming from two languages and also coming from multiple levels. So using the information network, we try to figure out, for example, uh, if the query and the answer, they appear in our uh, English IE output in monoling English data pretty frequently, which is, the, for example, this feature, then it's likely to be a good answer. So that can help us to remove errors like uh, Elizabeth Queen, uh, she, her residence was in Gulf, because these two, the, this query and answer appeared in English good data very, uh, very rarely. Right? We never saw them. So that gave us some additional evidence. OK, so then we compare the results compared to the baseline. The, uh, these are the precision local F measure. And we can see uh, as we add more and more global features, our uh, performance always go up for, both pres um, for all kinds of combinations. One and two were basically the first pipeline uh, is the MT plus English IE. And the red one is basically the source language. And then we translate the answer. And the, the yellow one was a combination. OK. OK, so I would like to uh, add one more discussion, and then I will try to conclude my talk. So um, we compare different frameworks. So the question in our mind is, does redundancy always help or not? And what we consider as a good collaborator? And does that mean more collaborators are always better? So based on the results I showed so far, can you guys tell me from these two pictures which one may give us more productive results. So the first one is basically, if they do collaboration, it's a more diverse group. Right? The second one is less diverse group, but they look like experts. And also, the first group has more collaborators. The second has fewer collaborators. Which one do you think are likely to be more productive? Based on our experimental results I have shown you so far. <laughs> How many people say the first one? OK, two. So most people think the second one uh, are likely to be more pr productive, maybe, maybe because they, they are likely to agree on everything, right? And uh, also, the first one includes a baby, and uh, he probably won't count. In the so um, 
Yeah, so um, actually, uh, we from our uh, experiment I have shown you the, from the three frameworks, we can never tell because we observe that diversity is very important because remember I showed you the results from our own eight rankers. We didn't see significant gain compared to our best system. The reason is because our systems were not uh, diverse enough. Although the query level was already diverse enough because it comes from different documents. So diversity is very important. In that sense, the second picture doesn't sh ensure the diversity. And then active interaction among collaborators is very important. As Samar asked about the, um, how we choose a group of collaborators. And when they have the conflicting results, how we can uh, pick up the best one. So we showed that the majority voting works better than we always trust the best one, for example. So how we can imitate the it, it very active in discussion is very important. And then collaboration should have a reasonable performance. Remember, I showed you that when we combine the top eight uh, systems from other people, from other teams, then it's not always like we add more and more systems. It helps because after we add uh, low ranked ones, it, the performance actually goes down. right? And then the collaborators, they don't have to show, uh, they don't have to share some certain properties. They can be anything. For example, when you try to figure out the Jim Parsons Wikipedia link, doesn't have to be the documents including Jim Parsons. Any supporting information, for example, any documents talking about his age or his hometown are likely to help us. So that's our main observation so far. Uh, I still have a few minutes. I want to just to show some uh, ongoing work. It's, we just started this project. So the results we have shown so far, all uh, of them focus on one single data model, it is, which is text. So, and then we started, to, when we met to some um, multimedia people, they uh, deal with the information generation from images and videos. And then we found, OK, it's very interesting because very diverse information are embedded in different data modalities. For example, if we look at a multimedia web page about the soccer game between the, I think it's Brazil team and the US team, then we can find all kinds of information from the captions and the text descriptions, and then from the background speech, and then from the uh, images and the uh, videos keyframes. For example, these two people, they are shaking hands, and then the image IE system can identify who wins the game. It sounds mysterious, but that somehow they have that kind of system can do it, as long as you give them annotation of that kind of images. Okay. So the idea here is uh, we would like to use one data model information ingestion to improve the other. Let me just show you some concept proof, uh, very simple experiments we have done so far. For example, if I'm uh, searching Chelsea library in Google image search, then this will be the result, just using Chelsea library. And uh, among these different pictures, actually six of them are about uh, the Chelsea library in located in Australia. And uh, actually, two of them are wrong because this one is actually a hotel besides the Charles Library. And this one is another uh, government building, which is also located besides the Charles Library. Because Google search only used the surrounding documents. And some, uh, if there's an image tag, I think they use user the tags. And the two images are located in, in Chelsea in Massachusetts, two of them in London, and eight of them are in Michigan. And among the eight images about Michigan, this one is, I think he was an invited speaker. And somehow in the announcement, it says the speech will happen in this library. So it's really not talking about the library itself. And she is a library working in the library. I mean, you can say it's kind of relevant, but not uh, very relevant. OK, so the idea is if we can build the information networks like I showed you from text, for example, then we can at least cluster the different information networks into different groups. For example, for the Charles Library located in, um, in Michigan, we can at least uh, know what kind of organization is the subsidiary of this query, and uh, who are working for this library, and uh, uh, where it's located, where it's the headquarters. And then if we know the Chelsea, we can also use uh, relation suggestion to know Chelsea is located in Michigan, and then Michigan is located in USA. And then the idea is we can use this, for example, to expand the query. Let's just uh, send in the different alternative names and the location. Then we can get a much cleaner results. You can see here, uh, most of the images are relevant, maybe except this one. This one is actually the, you can see it's the employee of this library. Okay. And then we can use that as feedback to enrich our information network. So now you have a multimedia information networks. So this is our ongoing work. Um, 
I would say compared to previous work, I uh, who also use redundancy to improve IE. We try to extend the framework to cross document, and we try we focus more on how we can uh, imitate the interactions among different collaborators. And uh, we design this new information network, which can give us some flexibility to group group the collaborators using graph clustering and capture the interdependency in a more um, in an easier way. Uh, in the future, we are interested in especially how we can capture those implicit interdependency. And uh, um, next project is f will focus more on the multimedia redundancy. And then we also interested in how we can explore cross-genre redundancy. For example, um, there must be a lot of learning information uh, between news articles and uh, tweets for hurricane events. Um, and uh, we hope that, that this can boost our performance. However, I didn't uh, say everything honestly because one cost we did have is that these kind of frameworks are much more expensive in terms of computation than the baseline systems. So for example, the collaborative ranking one is, was very really expensive. Uh, for eight uh, baseline systems, we can finish, for example, processing two million documents in maybe one hour, and now we need about eight hours. So how to speed up the interactions and uh, the voting process and so on is a big problem. And that's also one of our future work. Okay. Uh, I don't have time to show the demo, but uh, if I'm interested, uh, these are the URLs. We had this idea we did uh, for the terrorism network identification domain. So basically, you can get the information network for each. Um, you click the terrorism organization name, and then you can get the members, and you can get the information network for each member. So if you have interest, you can play with it. Okay, thank you very much. And I w although my students are not here, are really grateful for their hard work. This was all done by them. Thank you. So we have some time for questions. Any questions? Yeah. Is it possible to identify documents for which it is easy to get accurate information as opposed to documents for which it is hard to get accurate information? Um, there are many pieces of information which are on the web thousands and millions of times. So if you can identify the documents that are easiest to work with, you have an easy to find. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Uh, so far, we only looked at how topical related that document is compared to each test document. So the process is more like dynamic. Whenever we get test document, we dynamically choose our training data and uh, collaborators. But we should look more at uh, the quality itself. For example, how noisy this document is. We had some simple filtering process, like if this is web data, we try to identify how, m how many structured uh, like tables are embedded and so on. But we don't have a very mathematical model to predict it yet. That's, that will be a good item to do for future work. Yes. Uh, in the machine translation aspect, mm -hmm. uh, you were saying that there are several approaches. You can translate the query yeah. and then go to the uh, source language. Mm -hmm. And then use it all. Yeah. If obviously, if you put everything in English, then you have that cross searching uh, advantage. Uh, but then you lose uh, the their advantages on the other side, too. So, when you are doing these and then you're making your calculations, I'm presuming that you're going to kind of put some kind of a um, uh, value differential on a translated document versus an original English document. Do you do that, and how do you do that, or you treat them as equivalent? Um, so we have a collaborative ranker, right? So we are oh, so one feature for that collaborative ranking algorithm is the system ID. Well, actually, it's the combination of system ID and the slot type. So we are hoping this ranking algorithm can assign weights automatically. For example, if from the training data it observes the Chinese system actually performs always worse than the monolingual English system on um, resident slot, then it should uh, assign some weight, low weight, automatically. So yeah. the training data determines what that weight will be? Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's quite difficult to predict that beforehand, actually. So that's why we use the supervised ranking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you were saying that it worked out better if you translated the whole document versus 
translating the query, right? Yeah, it's, <coughs> it's really just because the uh, Chinese IE system is not so mature yet. Right. Yeah. That's another factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, it can, um, basically what we observe is the Chinese IE plus query translation can give us higher real core but a very bad precision because the exhaustion uh, precision is bad. And the um, machine translation plus English I give us much lower real core but a much higher precision because if a machine translation missed some information already, we have no way to recover it, basically, later. Yeah, so that's why if we combine two things together, they are complementary. We hope. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole point of going to another language, to have that uh, diversity. Yeah, yeah. And for some queries, like some local Chinese partition query, for example, um, even though the Chinese IE system is not mature, but since most of the information must be embedded in the source language data, so you have a higher potential to mine them instead of applying monolingual from English data, because you want to see the information in English data anyway. Yeah. Okay. Just one question. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this is actually implemented or it's implicit in your mm -hmm. model. Like, if there are, for example, some systems that are more experts, so that they'll perform better on one type of, let's say, slot types, mm -hmm. and other systems will perform better on other type of slot mm -hmm. type, are you going to, in your system, when you do the combination, try to predict all of this, are you going to give more weights to the, let's say, experts on that? Yes, yeah, so we have, we have one uh, feature, like I said, let me show. Mm. See here. So um, we have the system and slot type. Okay. So um, we we hope that this can help. And also some systems, if it's really better system, then some uh, very simple clue. For example, one system must have some bug. They predict, uh, for example not a number, string as age, and so then we also check the s surface features for the like token combined with the slot type to, to adjust the weights. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If you have a good that source, mm. now, do you track it over time? Let's say someone builds up a good or another person used to be good, but then they became an alcoholic and really started to think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, that's a really good point. Actually, uh, when I present this to other participants in the evaluation, they had that complaint because they said, you know, last year we had only two students working on the system, now we have eight. So h how can you, you know, give us the weights based on last year's system? Yes, yeah, so I don't know how to adjust that question actually. It's, uh, it's really nice. I mean, um, ideally we, we don't want any training data to predict the weights because Maybe uh, we have some new participants coming this year, or we have some new data. So uh, I know that Eugene Ajinstan had a paper this year at ETKI about how to use EM to predict uh, uh, wha how, how good this document is or how good the system is. Maybe we should pursue some, some production like that. Yeah. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.